So Ken Burr, my, one of my theology professors, he taught me a lot about who God is and um, how to follow him. All right, and I, I got to see that, not just hear from what he said, um, but see that as he lived. Um, I got to go to South Africa with him on a school trip uh, for three weeks and see how he loved God. Um, Ken Brewer recently died uh, somewhat unexpectedly, um, and I was reminded of the impact he had on my life, to be able to talk about that with people I'm closest with, to see um, how he impacted me personally and how he impacted so many others. Um, and so I want to talk about somebody who impacted somebody else from the Bible. We're going to talk about Peter, who impacted the life of Cornelius. Um, but before we get into that, I want to talk about how we're going to view this story. All right? So normally when you read a Bible story, you're reading it and you're just reading the story. But today we're going to look at the story of Peter and Cornelius from Acts 10 through the lens of John 1.14, which Cole read. All right? We're going to look at it through this lens of grace and truth. And before, before we get in, I want to make sure we understand what grace and truth mean. All right? So what is grace? Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. All right? It is by God's grace that we are saved. We don't deserve it. We don't, we don't follow his law all right, perfectly. We don't deserve this salvation, yet we receive it. God loved us so much that he sent his son Jesus to die for us so that our sins might be forgiven and we would receive salvation. That is grace. All right? Grace is not the act of giving a blank check to do whatever you want. All right? Grace is receiving what we don't deserve. All right? So that's grace. What is truth? There we go. All right? So when we think about truth, most of the time we're talking about a, a factual reality. All right? It's true that Lansing is the capital of Michigan. That's a true fact. It used to be Marshall, there's your history fact, but now it's Lansing. All right? We talk spiritually and theologically, dealing with God. Truth refers to the will and being of God. All right? That's why John 17:17 17, 17 tells us God's word is truth. In John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. All right, truth gets tricky when we start to confuse truth and interpretation and opinion, all right? For a little lighthearted one, it's my, my, my truth, my opinion, that I, I know it's true that the Detroit Lions are the best football team, all right? I know it's true, that's what I interpret, all right? But someone in Dallas is gonna interpret the Dallas Cowboys to be uh, the best football team, and they're just flat out wrong. <laughs> even, though, even though that's what they interpret to be truth, I think they're wrong. And they're going to say, hey, you're wrong too. All right? That's interpretation and opinion. That is not truth. All right? We're talking about truth, a factual reality, but specifically referring to the being and will of God. All right? So I want, to, I want you to take, if you've got a Bible, open it up. If you want to use the Pew Bible, you can open that up too. If you've got your phone, teenagers don't use your phone Bible, but everyone else can use their phone Bible. All right? I want you paying attention here. We are, we are going to look, and we're going to go through a good portion of this story. All right? We're going to specifically talk about Peter. All right? So we're going to read Acts 10, 9 through 23, and then we're going to skip a couple verses and read 34 through 48. All right? So we're reading a lot. You're getting, you're getting a story here. Getting the whole thing. Well, most of the whole thing. We're skipping Cornelius because he's, he's too cool for me. All right. So Acts 10, 9 through 23. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. These people on their journey are Cornelius' men, who have been sent by Cornelius because Cornelius heard from God to send men to Peter. Peter became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven open and something like a large sheet being let down to earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals, as well as reptiles and birds. Then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheet was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. 
they called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so, go, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to ask you to come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. And now in between this, Peter goes to Cornelius' house. And this is what Peter begins to preach at Cornelius' house, starting in verse 34. Then Peter began to speak, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened through the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all people, but by witnesses whom God has already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. All right? When we look at this in grace and truth, the first thing we see is that Peter needs grace. And actually, that grace is given in truth from God. Peter's first thought of this vision, I'm sure, and I I can read this and and see it, is of the practice of kosher food laws in Leviticus 11. All right? If you go back in the Old Testament, read Leviticus 11, you see that God gave dietary restrictions, dietary um, commandments to the Jews to set them apart from the world. All right? So that means, hey, that bacon cheeseburger you're about to go enjoy for lunch, you can't eat if you're following the kosher food laws. All right? You can't eat shrimp. All right? That might have saved red lobster from bankruptcy, but you can't, you can't eat shrimp if you're kosher. All right? And as a faithful Jewish man, Peter would have kept kosher. All right? And he wouldn't have used, he wouldn't have eaten those animals, he wouldn't have used milk and, and meat in the same meal, he would have avoided that. All right? In modern days, if you go to a kosher kitchen, all right, this is how seriously people take it, you have completely two sets of silverware. You have two sets of dishes. You have two sets of pots and pans because they don't want to mix their dairy and their meat. They don't want to make themselves unclean through the way that they eat. And as we read that this vision happened three times, we know Peter is like, hey, like I'm, 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 I'm eating kosher. Like I'm not just going to come up and, and eat that pig. All right? That's not going to happen. I'm going to eat kosher. All right? He's doing this, and we need to remember that Peter and things happening three times is not a new idea. All right? Peter's probably like, hey, this is a test that I'm going to pass. All right? That's, that's what's happening here. I'm being tested on my faithfulness. All right? If you think back in Peter's life, Right? Peter denied Jesus three times in John 18, 15 through 26. And then Jesus asked Peter if he loves him three times in John 21, 15 through 19. All right? To say, hey, like you did this, and it's called Peter's reinstatement. All right? Things happening to Peter three times is not a new thing. And three is a significant number. It signifies completeness. When we think about the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that's three. All right, this three is this completeness. All right, Peter's thinking, hey, this is a complete test. But he realizes, hey, that's, that's not what's going on here. All right, by the time these people come. All right, Cornelius is a Gentile. 
And a Gentile is someone who is not Jewish. All right? Not Jewish by heritage. All right? Even though Cornelius is a righteous and God-fearing man, he's not Jewish. All right? And there's no precedent for Peter and other believers for Gentiles being included all right, and given the Holy Spirit. You know, up to this point, the only people who have been given the Holy Spirit are the disciples, those were, who were around at Pentecost, all right, who were all there to celebrate a Jewish festival. They were the ones that received it. And the disciples have gone to the Jews that they've known and the Samaritans who have some Jewish heritage. So if you're going to count them as they're not Gentiles, and they're, they're kind of Jews. And that's who's been included in the early church. That's who's received the Holy Spirit. All right? They have no idea that the Gentiles are even going to be included. You know, the three times that Peter has this vision feels a little bit like training, all right? where God is teaching Peter how to interact with the world. All right? Since he's been adequately taught now, hey, don't call anything impure that I've made clean. He can go and perform the task and teach others and bring grace and truth to others. All right? In my free time, when I am free, I like to play disc golf. All right? My teens know it. I just heard a chuckle down there. They know I play disc golf. And I play disc golf a lot. All right? Now, here's the problem. I'm not great at it. All right? I'm okay. I have fun. That's my goal. I will never be a world champion. Now, I have a friend who is a collegiate national champion, and her and I started playing at the same time, so I feel like I'm lacking here. But I still love playing disc golf. All right? So if I said, hey, come and play disc golf with me, all right? And the first time you play disc golf, you would be really bad, all right? Because you have no knowledge of how to play. You have no knowledge of how to throw a disc. You have no knowledge of, of any of this, all right? Even as you play more, if you're not being instructed and, and taught and trained, you're not going to be great. All right? For all the years I've played, I'm not great. All right? But I've never really received true instruction and training and teaching on how to play disc golf. All right? This receiving the teaching, all right, this vision is grace to Peter. Because Peter needs grace. It's grace to Peter all right, to include others. And it's truth that gives grace. And it's grace that gives truth. If you hear any other words more than grace and truth in this sermon, I've done wrong. You guys are going to have grace and truth coming out your ears by the time we're done here. All right? So Peter needs grace. We need grace. Peter needs truth. We need truth. What is that? The gospel is what gives us truth. I call it grace-giving truth. This truth this real thing, this factual reality that refers to the will and being of God that brings us grace. All right? That brings us grace. I love how in Acts 10, um, 40, uh, sorry, 43, everyone who believes in, his, in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. We all need that grace. And the truth that brings that is Jesus' gospel. So when Peter preaches to the Gentiles, he appeals to truth to bring grace. All right, if you just look at 10, 34 through 43, all right, there are two times where Peter uses the phrase, you know, appealing to truth. Two times where Peter uses the word witnesses. All right, a witness is somebody who testifies to what is true, who says, hey, I saw this, this is true, or hey, I have, a, I have an expert, expert certification in this. I know that this is true. And he uses testify to say, hey, they are sharing truth. He uses, you know, witnesses and testify two times each, just in this, appealing to truth. And while truth is the focus of Peter's sermon, the main action taking place is grace. God's grace is being extended to the Gentiles in the first major way. All right? Peter and the other Jewish Christians, that they don't comprehend this, but the truth of the day all right, for the Jewish people, was that the Gentiles were impure and unacceptable. Even as Cornelius is called a righteous and God-fearing man, which meant that he believed in, in God. He believed in the, in the God of the Jewish people. 
Right? But he didn't have the same rights and freedoms as, as a Jewish person coming into the temple or synagogue to worship. Cornelius was faithful to God. He just wasn't Jewish. Even then, because he was a Gentile, he was considered impure and unacceptable. But the truth of the gospel is a vehicle by which grace is delivered. Peter coming and preaching, all right, delivered grace and truth, not just to Cornelius, but to himself. All right, we say Peter needs grace. He's getting grace as he's preaching. All right, I love Acts 10, 15 to go back. One of my favorite verses in this whole, this whole story. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. The grace here is that God has given the impure, I'm going to put that in quotations, impure Gentiles the ability to be made clean. And the truth is that God is already doing it. All right? He's already working in Cornelius' life. He's already said, Cornelius, send these men. All right? As Peter's having this vision, the men are already on their way. When he's thinking about this vision, the men are there. Since we have received both the truth of the gospel and the grace that is delivered by it, we have to look, sorry, I wrote this last night. We have to look at what we are supposed to do now. All right? If we get the grace and truth from the gospel, what are we supposed to do with it? Peter gets this grace and truth in this vision. What is he supposed to do about it? So the big question is, what does it look like to live in grace and truth? For a lot of us, we don't like giving grace to those we don't want to give grace to. And we don't like telling hard truths to people we don't want to tell hard truths to. All right? As we live, we have to do that at some point. Because living inevitably leads to sacrifice. But what we sacrifice can drastically change our life. All right? There are people who I'm like, hey, like, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to cause any issues with them, so I'm, I'm not going to tell them this thing that, hey, they should probably change about their life. Or, hey, I really do not like this person. I'm not going to give them the grace. I'm going to nitpick every little tiny thing that they did wrong. All right? No grace for them, just truth. In our life, we either sacrifice grace for truth or truth for grace. But really, the goal is to sacrifice ourselves for grace and truth. It's not easy to give grace and truth to somebody. Our wants and our needs get in the way of that. Living in grace and truth right, is not an individual endeavor, but a communal effort to live like Jesus. All right? It is really hard to just together say, hey, I'm going to sacrifice myself to share grace and truth with people. I'm going to do this all by myself, by the strength of my own, to show God's love. Number one, that's wrong because you're not doing it with God if you're doing it by yourself. All right? If you're going to show grace and truth, you need to be connected to God. You need to know what grace and truth are. You need to live it with Jesus. All right? But you also need to live it with people. All right? Even Peter didn't come to Cornelius' house by himself. Cornelius didn't find this by himself. All right? Cornelius had men go to Peter, bring him back. Cornelius' household, Peter, and he brought people with him. All right? There is a community that is happening here. As we, as a church, strive to live in grace and truth, all right? giving what others don't deserve, and living in, in the truth of God's will and being. We need to be with others. We need to be building each other up. We need to be saying, hey, how are you doing in living like Jesus? How are you doing in sacrificing yourself for the matters of grace and truth, for spreading the love of Jesus? If we live with neither grace nor truth, or only one of grace or truth, it leads to an incomplete understanding of our calling as Christians. So this graph right here, 
um, is from a guy named Ben Sternke. All right? And he has a blog, and he, he's writing about grace and truth. Um, and so when you look and say, okay, on the top, all right, the top two, those are things that have grace. All right, the bottom two below this line, no grace. And all the way to the right, that's your right, yep, that's my right too. All the way to the right is truth. And to the left, no truth. So in the bottom we get, all right, the bottom left right here is apathy. We live with no grace and no truth. All right, it's apathy. We don't care what happens. We don't care what happens to anybody. All right? We're apathetic about it. It doesn't matter. Whatever. Let them live their life how they want. Who cares? All right? That's not Jesus. That's very, very obviously not Jesus. Jesus is all about reaching others. He cares. If we say, hey, we're just going to have grace. All right? That's all, that's all we need. We don't, we don't need truth. We just need grace. It brings a hangout culture. All right? What Ben Sternke means by hangout culture is this, all right? You're looking for and trying to keep the peace, but you never actually achieve true peace, all right? Let's say you're in a group of friends and you've got somebody who is just saying the dumbest stuff imaginable, all right? And you're just like, hey, just let him go because if we correct him, he's going to get mad at us and it's going to be an issue, all right? You're just letting him go and it's like, yeah, we're just trying to hang out but there's never actually any peace because he's going to have this idea, all right? And sometimes those ideas are harmful, all right? And it just kind of sits there, and there's no, there's no diving in. There's no actual relationship. It's just a surface level. Yeah, cool, we can hang out, you know, play a video game or two, go, go disc golf, right? There's, there's nothing there. There's just grace. There's no actual truth happening, all right? In a truth but no grace culture, all right, when we live with truth and no grace, we get a call-out culture. All right, this is the one, to be honest with you guys, this is the one that I feel like I am very susceptible to, to try and, and say, hey, like, I'm all about truth, and I, and I miss my grace, and I'm just, hey, you're doing wrong, call it out. All right, and that's not, that's not necessarily how we're supposed to be. All right, a call-out culture picks at every issue when it's probably not an issue. All right. Um, one of my favorite stories about Martin Luther, who is uh, the German uh, church reformer, uh, founder of Pro Protestantism, um, when he was still a Catholic priest, he would go to confession every day uh, and spend hours there um, confessing just the tiniest things to be like, oh, like I've done this. And um, his confessor was like, hey, like, you know, some of these are like not actually like sins. You're just you're just, say, you're just feeling bad about this. All right? And <laughs> it's just, this is what happens. Martin Luther, um, actually, as he was focused on this, it caused him physical health issues. All right? He was physically not well because he was so focused on trying to pick out this sin in his life without actually showing the love of Jesus to anybody without actually living in grace, all right? Call-out culture, when you think call-out culture, it's a lot of, hey, I'm calling somebody else out, but call-out culture is also calling ourselves out. That's not Jesus, all right? Jesus is this, living in grace and truth, a call-in culture, all right? Calling into the mission of Jesus, which in John 13, 34 through 35, is to love one another as I have loved you. In John 8, Jesus tells the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more after he has saved her from the stoning of the Pharisees. He's not saying, hey, you're good, fine, whatever. You got caught in sin, but you're, you're fine, whatever. Here's grace. He says, go and sin no more. Acknowledging the truth is she's got sin in her life. The truth is we have sin in our life. And that's not okay. But the grace is, Jesus came for us, died for us, that our sins might be forgiven, and to live in that forgiveness. In order to live in a grace and truth 
call-in culture, we need to seek radical heart change towards self-sacrifice and love. We need to say, it's not grace for me and not for thee. It's grace for everybody. We need to not say, hey, you're sinning, you're sinning, you're sinning, you're sinning, I'm sinning, blah, 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 blah. We need to say, yes, you're sinning, but there is grace. There is Jesus who brings forgiveness. As we, as we live lives as a Christian, our life needs to be filled with grace and truth as we strive to live how Jesus lived. We need to be open not just to giving grace or truth, but sacrificing our wants to be filled with grace and truth. If there's anything else filling us up, we're missing something. We need to be filled with Jesus. Jesus' love, which is grace and truth for others. As a church, we want to have a culture that calls people into the mission of the church. Into that mission. To reach our neighbors with the grace-giving truth of the gospel. The Great Commission, Jesus' last words in Matthew, Matthew 28. Go and make disciples of all nations. You can't go and make disciples if you've only got surface level hangout conversations or you're calling everybody out and calling yourself out for, for everything they do wrong and just leaving it at that. Making disciples is bringing grace when we mess up and truth when we need to hear it. The gospel is grace-giving truth. The truth that we know is real. All right? I know that Jesus died for my sins. I know that Jesus loves me. I have seen Jesus work in my life. All right? I know this. Peter says, you know. I do know. Peter says, we're going to be witnesses. I, that's, that's my call. Peter says, you're going to testify. I do testify to that. The grace and truth God has given me through Jesus and the way I've lived, even though I mess up, especially because I mess up, and the grace and truth that I receive. Grace and truth. We're going to live in that call-in culture, called in to the mission to share the gospel. Jesus' love. God loved us so much that Jesus died for our sins so that we might be forgiven and give grace-giving truth.